Our season comes to a conclusion this year with a fantastic gathering of music that celebrates the orchestra and the art of orchestration. And when it comes to that art, no discussion is complete without the closing work on this program, Ravel's orchestration of Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition. It's a wonderful way to showcase the ensemble and its individual components for this grand finale. We'll also encounter a rousing, yet less commonly performed work that marks Beethoven's farewell to purely orchestral music. It's a perfectly fitting way to bring this season's celebration of Beethoven to a close. There's so much that can be said about this program. Its contrasts are as enticing as its similarities, and each and every work on the program could fill my discussion on its own. But because the element of orchestration is such a dominant factor in pictures at an exhibition, I've decided to focus on that topic as we consider the entire program. But what is orchestration? Simply put, it's the way instruments are used and combined to create tone colors. It's the way the instrumental forces are deployed to create the full sonic palette that we hear from an orchestra. Now that might sound like it's actually a simple art, but it's actually very complex, and it's one that some of the greatest composers never really master. In fact, nowadays, a lot of composers working in certain areas use teams of other orchestrators to bring their musical ideas to life. That's actually the common practice in the world of film score, for example. So many factors play into orchestration, including composers' styles, their national traditions, the availability of instruments, financial considerations, and technological development and limitations. It can be a balancing act between dreams and reality. When we hear a piece of orchestral music, it might seem as if it arrived in the composer's mind completely formed as an orchestral score, but that's rarely the case. Most composers tend to begin with a piano score or what we call a short score that has just a few staves and indications of what instruments might end up playing the music in the final version. Now, in some cases, a work is so complex that a composer ends up having to go directly to the big score but that's actually less common. And we usually view orchestration as yet another stage of the overall large scale creative process. One of the most enlightening ways to explore a composer's approach to orchestration is to see how they orchestrate a work that was originally written for piano. Modest Mussorgsky's Pictures at an Exhibition is one shiny example of a piano score that is just ripe with possibilities. Mussorgsky composed pictures at an exhibition after attending a gallery show of art by his friend Viktor Hartmann, who had died the year before at the age of 39. Over the course of three weeks, Mussorgsky wrote 10 pieces for solo piano inspired by works in that show and accompanied by what he called a series of promenades, that is music that portrays walking between the works in the gallery space. Although Mussorgsky intended to publish the piano score, he never got around to it and it wasn't until five years after his death that the first edition was finally released. But within a year of its publication, other composers had began trying their hand at adapting portions of that work for orchestra. Now there are dozens of versions for orchestra, but by far the most popular is that by Maurice Ravel, who created his own version that only lacked one of the promenades in 1922. Now this is hardly surprising given that Ravel is considered one of the greatest masters of orchestration to have ever lived. His score calls for a large orchestra with over 30 different instruments, and in most cases, multiple players on each of those instruments. So his starting palette is rather expansive, but the availability of so many options can be truly daunting. Take, for example, the opening promenade. Mussorgsky starts with just a single line playing the main melody, 
followed by a response with five lines playing together in harmony. So the first big question for an orchestrator would be who plays that opening line? It could be any of those 30 plus instruments. It could be multiple instruments in unison on the same note. And that could mean multiple players of the same instrument or multiple instruments playing the same line. That one decision about the sound that sets the entire work in motion has implications for everything that follows. Some composers might opt for the richness of a full string section. Others might think a simpler, more pure sound like a solo flute would be a good fit. But Ravel's choice of a solo trumpet gives the opening line a nobility and a sense of confidence that sets the stage for the great journey ahead. Then we encounter another huge question. When the other voices enter, who should be playing? It's an opportunity to bring in a different perspective. Maybe now it's time for the string choir or woodwinds to provide some contrast. Here, Ravel opts for the brass section, a more consistent palette that brings in a more cohesive sound for that solo voice. He then continues this alternation between the solo trumpet and the brass, but soon he does broaden the range of tone colors, bringing in the strings, and the resultant richness is so satisfying. Since the promenade is music portraying our walking between works in the gallery, it makes sense that the full range of emotions and colors come onto the scene and are in full display. So by the time that we come to the end of the movement, the full orchestra is there in all of its glory. But the brilliance, the resonance of the whole ensemble is the result of an orchestrator who knows what combinations of instruments are most effective in which configurations. Let's take a look at the orchestration in another movement. The fourth picture is called bidwo. It's the Polish word for cattle, and it features a large, heavy ox cart. Mussorgsky's piano score consists of a trudging accompaniment that sounds like the footsteps of oxen drawing their immense load. Over this, we hear a thick, expansive melody that seems to develop forever. It begins quietly, as if the cart is in the distance, and then it becomes more and more present as the cart passes by, and eventually it fades out of sight. Surely the first question is how Mussorgsky's plodding footstep motive can be captured in orchestral sound. Well, he gives some hints as to appropriate instruments by casting it in the lower register. So some instruments like flute, oboe, trumpet, violin would be unlikely candidates. Indeed, Ravel opts for some more obvious choices, beginning with muted low strings that are divided within the sections and bassoons and contrabassoon, a heavyweight instrument capable of playing the lowest note in the orchestra. But what about that main melody? It's right in the middle range, essentially 
straddling between the treble and bass clefs. It could be played by most any instrument. Should it be played by the full viola section altogether? Or maybe by clarinets altogether? Or maybe solo horn clarinet and the viola section? Any of these would work quite well. But Ravel opts for the solo tuba. It's an instrument that has a thick, rich sound that matches the depth of the accompanimental texture, but because it's cast in the unusual high register of the tuba, it stands out in wonderful contrast. When Ravel scored this tuba part, he had in mind the very small French tuba in the key of C, pitched an octave above the more common bass tuba. So it's an extremely high and treacherous solo when played on the common tuba we see today. So now most tubas have to make a difficult decision. Do I play my regular, more comfortable bass tuba, where the solo is frighteningly difficult, or do I play a smaller tuba or, as is sometimes the case, do I hand it off to a trombonist who might play it on a similar instrument, the euphonium? For our performances, you'll find that principal tubist Bo Atlas is going to be walking the middle ground. He's going to be playing on a tuba in F, which falls halfway between the low bass tuba and the high French tuba. These are just a small handful of the types of decisions a composer has to consider in the orchestration process. I hope they invite increased appreciation of what went into orchestrating a vast work, like pictures at an exhibition. Really, at any given moment, we could be awed and mesmerized by both the vast realm of possibilities Ravel had and the choices he made in the face of such immense freedom. So what about the rest of the program? How does orchestration figure into our experience with the other music? As I mentioned earlier, composers usually start with a score for piano or a short score with just a few lines that they later orchestrate. But a piano concerto introduces a whole other level of consideration. A concerto is essentially a dialogue between the soloist and the orchestra. So when we have a piano soloist, it's this amazing combination of a solo instrument and an orchestral version of that instrument. From the outset of Tchaikovsky's Piano Concerto No. 1, we get an amazing example of how a simple line of music takes on a striking character through its orchestration. Tchaikovsky begins his concerto with a luscious, expansive melody that eventually is in the piano part, but first the orchestra gets a shot at it. He opens with a particularly bold stroke. Rather than present the full melody, he gives us a dramatic introduction based on just the first four notes. And four horns in unison burst forth, followed by a chord from the full orchestra. The pattern repeats three times, almost like it's stuttering, before it gives way to the full melody. And just before that melody enters, we hear from the piano with a series of huge, rich chords. And while the expansive melody is being played in the orchestra, the soloist is playing accompaniment. <laughs>
Tchaikovsky could have opted for just about any instrument to play the opening passage. So why four horns? Clearly he was going for a bold sound, while the brass section seems like an obvious candidate there. And while trumpets or trombones would surely yield a stunning result, the horn, due to its shape and design, produces a more broad, less direct tone. The choice of four horns is significant as well. Of course, four is going to be louder than one, two, or three players, but there's also an aspect of acoustics to be noted here. Although the musicians are surely going to be playing with impeccable precision, there will always be subtle differences in pitch and timing, and that kind of interference, so long as it's not too far off, produces a richer, fuller sound. Finally, we can note that the standard Romantic era horn section consists of four horn players. So when it comes to the horns, Tchaikovsky essentially has all hands on deck. Now when that passionate melody arrives in full form, Tchaikovsky uses first violins and cellos who are used to taking the most soloistic material. It's a natural fit. And he has them playing the line an octave apart for a fuller sound and it also puts the cellos in their most expressive register. Again, among a seemingly infinite array of possibilities, here's a composer using his orchestrational prowess to ensure the greatest overall effect. The opening of the second movement allows us a glance at Tchaikovsky's more intimate orchestration. It begins with a remarkable, simple, spacious melody. It's a melody that would be haunting and very expressive in a solo oboe, or perhaps even more so in a solo cello or viola. On a trumpet, it might seem more confident and somewhat regal, and a horn might seem more nostalgic and distant but Tchaikovsky gives the line to a solo flute accompanied by plucked strings. The effect is magnificent. It heightens that sense of simplicity and gives the melody an airy quality. And while the flute hands that tune off to the solo piano, the mood remains unbroken because the colors, the feel, the sound are really consistent. Last season, we encountered the music of Jessie Montgomery when the orchestra played her work, Banner, and we got a taste of her brilliant command of orchestration. With Starburst, we have a chance to hear something quite different from the other works on the program. Rather than working with that full symphonic complement of 30 or so different instruments, Starburst is scored for just strings, that is, four different instruments that are all in the same family. Now there are multiple players on each of those instruments and the violins are split into two different parts, but it might seem at first as if the range of tone colors is somewhat limited. But here's where we see that orchestration is not just what instruments we use, but how we use those instruments. There's a vast range of sounds and colors that can be created on each of those string instruments. They can be played with a bow or plucked. There are different ways of plucking, and the bow provides endless possibilities. The tone is different depending on which part of it touches the string, and where it is placed on the string, and how it moves on the string. 
A player can move from soft, fuzzy sounds to sharp, percussive ones with ease. And then there are extended techniques, for example, harmonics, where a player lightly touches on the string, yielding a bell-like, pure tone. In its brief three and a half minutes duration, Starburst employs a variety of, of approaches for string orchestration, and the results are wonderful. It's perfectly appropriate for a work described by the composer as a play on the imagery of rapidly changing musical colors. Throughout this season, we've heard a lot of orchestral music by Beethoven, and we've noted how he encouraged the expansion of that ensemble by embracing the use of additional instruments. We've also noted how he expanded the world of orchestration in experimentation in his overtures, concertos, and symphonies. During the last years of his life, Beethoven turned his sights away from the orchestra and focused on the more intimate world of the string quartet, creating some of the most divine music ever written. His Ninth Symphony was the last large-scale work he completed for orchestra, but as that also included vocal soloists and choir, it's really considered a choral orchestral work. And this means that his last major work for orchestra alone was the overture for the consecration of the house, completed in 1822, the same year that he began serious work on the ninth. <laughs> The consecration of the house was composed for a concert celebrating the reopening of a theater in Vienna that had been renovated. So it's music that's intended to be energetic and joyous. It was also composed at a time when Beethoven was returning to his studies of the music of Handel, whom he considered to be the greatest composer who had ever lived. Indeed, we hear the influence of Handel throughout this work. First with the so-called French overture form, it begins slow and then moves fast. And in the slow section, it's marked by jagged rhythms. And in the fast section, we hear the extensive use of Baroque-style counterpoint, where multiple individual lines combine to dizzying effect. But Beethoven also channels Handel's orchestration. Handel's orchestra didn't have the full range of instruments that were available to Beethoven. They were usually marked by strings, and possibly double reeds such as oboes and bassoons, uh, inclusion of brass such as trumpets, almost always with timpani or horns. So when we hear the fanfares with trumpets and timpani in this overture, it sure seems reminiscent of something like Handel's music for the Royal Fireworks. And when it comes to virtuosic use of instruments, take note of this very busy bassoon line in this passage. <laughs> Later, as Beethoven moves into the fast counterpoint sections, he again refers to Handel's orchestration by pairing oboes and bassoons with strings for a reedy melodic sound that we associate with the Baroque era. To learn much more about the music on this program, its history, and the composers who created it, please be sure to read Richard E. Rada's notes in the program book. And now I invite you to join us, the Des Moines Symphony Orchestra and Maestro Joseph Junta, for our season finale, Pictures at an Exhibition. <laughs> 